Dave's Five Hot Takes. Yeah! Hey guys, welcome back to Dave's Five Hot Takes. This is Dave, and I'm going to be giving you some hot takes this week. Some super hot, some honestly not very hot at all, and then maybe most that land in that sort of hotel hot love. Hot love? <laughs> hot love. <laughs> hot tub level heat, which is, you know, you sort of don't know if you want to get in because that little toe gets in there. It's it's hot. It's hot. But then a minute in, you're like, oh, this is really not that bad. Also, should you be getting in hotel hot tubs? I digress. But you know what? Let's jump on in. Hot take one. Now, what's fun about this is that bass line, which, yes, that was a bass. <laughs> I'm sure somebody thought, is that a laser gun? She could either be, some of you heard that as the bass line to You Give Love a Bad Name. Some still heard it as the bass line to Belinda Carlisle's ubiquitous Heaven is a place on earth, right? Now, isn't that fascinating? I noticed that in the car the other morning as I was driving. Heaven is a place on earth came on, and I was like, why do I know this bass line? And I realized I sat and listened to both that and love, You Give Love a Bad Name, and they are so similar. The chord progression is half of that, which is the 6-4-5-6 six, six chord progression, which are both songs, and they both kind of change toward the end of those courses. But, I mean, they are almost verbatim bass lines. And that's not just a bass line that would be – you know, oh, I accidentally placed that or played that because it's way too specific in uh, the way it moves and stuff. That blew my mind. Other fun fact about that, You Give Love a Bad Name was released in 1985, and guess what? You, Heaven is a Place on Earth, 86. So Bon Jovi would win that argument in court if anybody ever sued over bass lines, which maybe that's an argument for the uh, uh, Ice Ice Baby Queen debacle. But um, I thought that was fascinating. Go back and listen to them both, and I think you'll get a kick out of how similar they are. Hot take two. There's a lot of things that I love talking about on this podcast, but but I would say one of the reasons that I love doing it and sort of the impetus for me wanting to have this podcast in the first place was to sort of celebrate or draw attention to these anomalies in music, especially in pop music that, how did they get away with that? Or why was that okay and nobody cared? Or isn't it cool that they were able to pull this thing off and nobody noticed? I love these little weird inconsistencies. And this song is another one of those. Um, Red Hot Chill. Chili Peppers sold a squeeze. It was a number one modern rock song the year it came out. So this was a big song. This is not um, where I go, I just don't know. It's a great song. And I'll tell you what, sidebar, Anthony Kiedis of the Red Hot Chili Peppers may be the best pop songwriter, chorus pop songwriter without them ever being choruses or without them ever really being I mean and that's not fair all the time but I feel like he he just has this fascinating way of making songs hits that if I sang that song for you on guitar you'd be like yeah I don't know if I like that but something about what they do is so incredible and the way he communicates he can make these songs hits I digress but this song is so fascinating to me because it's a huge hit. It's it's massive. I had it on the Conehead soundtrack for everybody that remembers that soundtrack. But one of the things that's so cool about it is it has this moment where he literally just digresses into singing Dong ba dong dong say ba dong am nom ma dicky ducky bigga dong dong get. That's literally if you go listen to that song, he sings that almost exact lyric. It is absolute gibberish. Gibberish in a pop or I guess a modern rock hit. And, you know, I just love the thought that they were sitting in the room and listening back and they were like, he's saying that and like, yeah, that, that totally plays. I love that. And I think when so many people are out there trying to be Leonard Cohen's of our day, you have this moment where a man literally sings not even mildly intelligible, intelligible lyrics. Boy, the irony on me messing up the word intelligible is not lost on me. And yet, you know, it's a huge hit. Nobody cares. It's awesome. It somehow adds to the song. I love how bizarre and weird. And you know what, folks? Just be brave. Get out there and get weird and sing gibberish in your songs. You never know when you're sitting on a modern rock hit. Hot take three. Coming in pretty hot on this take. I really miss artists and their eclectic albums. I think this is one thing that sort of makes me like an old fogey. <laughs> when I think about albums, like, you don't know what you're missing, son. You ain't never heard real music. Is like you think about some of these iconic artists from yesteryear, if you will, Stevie Wonder and James Taylor, Billy Joel, Elton John, the Doobie Brothers. Um, so many artists put out records that would have such a weird, like run the gamut. I mean, even for like you think about Stevie and Hotter Than July. 
He's got, uh, don't worry about your sleep on me. I ain't gonna stand for it, which was kind of his country song, quote unquote, next to Master Blaster and these other songs on that record that are reggae and weird. And yet the public was like, yes, we will take all of everything you've got. It doesn't have to be a genre. I mean, listen to the music to China Grove to, uh, oh, Blackwater, keep on. Doobie Brothers, Paul Simon, give me a break. I mean, that guy, and he and Billy Joel, I think, have, have, Solo artists, they have the widest birth of that, of kind of like so many genres within one artistry. And I really miss that. Like I wish I wish artists were could do that. I think there are more constraints these days and record labels are not as bold and it's a little scary. Cause and I think too, as a public, we kind of want to know, hey, what does he do? And you go, Oh, he's like country, and you go, Cool, country. And then you send him off in your brain so you can sort of think about the world in these boxes. You know, maybe that's just how my brain works. But I do miss that. I, and I think if you're an artist listening to this, like go back and check out how some of these artists that we all grew up on and loved, they had so I mean, James Taylor. I mean, you think about some of the like R and B sort of like light R and B songs he'd have on records next to totally acoustic songs, you know. And so, I, I, to, to just this is just a hot take to to get you guys, you know, to be brave and get out there and all you guys and gals who make music and and don't worry about being eclectic. Like a good song is a good song; it's going to stand on its own. And sometimes the most fun we can have as artists is knowing we have four or five lanes to work with as opposed to one. Uh, that sort of nails us down to too much of a thing. So, um, yeah, so be brave. I believe in you. Hot take four. Okay, so one of my favorite things, one of my favorite stories in all of music, and this is this is uh, this is a molten lava hot take, but but for me, is the Phil Collins story, and and not just the hits that he had, which were. I think he had more hits than a bong in Woodstock, if you know what I'm saying. But the fact that this guy who was originally a drummer, grew up a drummer, that's what he did. He played drums, joins this band, Genesis. Uh, they need a drummer. He responds to an ad in a paper, and he goes and plays, starts playing drum in this band, and slowly kind of helps with some song stuff, slowly starts singing. Now, that's its own anomaly, that, that this drummer who didn't know that he could sing could sing. That's, that's a story enough to realize the iconic voice that he had as a singer. But most incredible to me is this fact that he had this thing in him for being a songwriter that he had no clue about, that he had lived his life up to 20 whatever years that was before he wrote uh, I Can Feel It in the Air Tonight, which was his first song he ever wrote. How about that for screwing the trajectory of your success up by starting the first song you ever write is one of the biggest hits in the 1980s, um, which is scary to think that he just continued that streak, but that... um, that he had this gift he didn't even know about. God made this dude to write songs or gave him the ability to write songs. And he didn't even figure that out until randomly he joins this band and starts writing a little bit on the side. And it's like, huh, goes through this terrible heartache and writes this song that's a monster hit. He has an incredible voice to back it up, none of which he knew five years before that. Um, not only was he an incredible writer, but he was, if I'm right on this, if then the book talks about this, his... his uh, autobiography, which is incredible. He was the most successful songwriter in the 1980s between his hits with Genesis and his solo hits. Now, when you think about the 1980s, was there a more golden age of songwriting, of artistry, of successful music? I don't think there was. And he sits atop that mountain by himself, a man who previously didn't know he could sing or write songs. And doesn't that sort of jack your paradigm up for thinking about what we have the ability to do that maybe we don't know we can do? I mean, I've always known in me, I'm like a world-class soccer player that just hasn't, I haven't had a time to shine, Lois. Um, But isn't that incredible that he sort of was born and had this thing that he never knew about until just chance encounter where he joins his band and he starts saying, yeah, maybe I'll sing. And then he goes to this heartache, writes a song and the rest of his song, I mean, the rest of his life is history. And the pop music, uh, you know, landscape is forever changed by this one man who didn't even know he could do it years before. Um, fascinating to me. I love that story. Hot take five. Okay, so I noticed this crazy consistency over these three super different random songs that I thought was really fun to to bring to light. The first of which, George Michael's Freedom. The second of which is Jeff Buckley's Last Goodbye. And the third of which is Harmony Hall by Vampire Weekend, or Weepend, (laughs) depending on how bad their week is going. Uh, 
here's the crazy, there's this rhythm, and especially in Harmony Hall by Vampire Weekend and Freedom by George Michael, and it's the piano part on the chorus of Harmony Hall on the intro slash, if you call it the chorus of Freedom, which is, <laughs> Harmony Hall, it's like the major version of that, which I'm not going to try to sing because my brain can't compute all these things at the same time, but it's literally that, that, it's that sort of piano thing. So at first I noticed those two and I thought, isn't that crazy? Because I just have to believe that when they were making that record, somebody had to have referenced that that George Michael album from 20 years before because it's such an iconic piano part but it sits really well on the track when you listen to that vampire weekend track it's such a great track the beginning and how it gets to the course it's amazing but then i was like why does that pattern seem so familiar to me and i realized it's the same sort of bass part which is not a piano part in jeff buckley's last goodbye at the beginning of last goodbye do 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 So there's this crazy rhythmic thing that again I just I can't help but wonder if there was something when Buckley was making that record and who knows if he listened to George Michael at all. But but that there was some sort of like subliminal motion was that one is especially close to George Michael's because they're they're both sort of dealing with close to the same chords and, and minor chords and stuff, um, where the, the Harmony Hall is a little more um, up-tempo and, and major sounding. But isn't that fascinating? Those three rhythms are so similar throughout very, very different songs over very different decades. Uh, but it's cool. I love these sort of anomalies when you can catch them in, in music like that, how it sort of reiterates itself over decades. Before I go, a quick heads up. Make sure to tap that subscribe or follow button. And if you wouldn't mind rating the podcast, that would be better than Christmas Day. Also, share it with a friend, and if you don't have a friend, just recommend it to me on my socials, at Dave Barnes Music, because I've actually never listened to this podcast. It would just feel too selfish. Thanks, guys, for hanging out one more time. There we are. It's another hot, hot batch of Dave's Five Hot Takes right out the, right out the oven. We, um, we had a good time, too, didn't we? I had a good time. I laughed at myself, which is <laughs> mildly disturbing, uh, and I feel like we learned a lot, but I'll tell you one thing we didn't learn is that Bob Marley thought he was writing country songs the whole time. <laughs> so, we'll see you next time on Dave's Five Hot Takes. Yeah!